Well, it is Mother's Day. And although that's not a date on the Christian calendar, it might as well be. There are some people who regard their mothers with a devotion that borders on the religious. And why not? I mean, these are the women who gave them life and birth. It's only right to be grateful. And when their mothers speak, they listen. At least some of them do. I asked the people who came to church last Wednesday night what their mothers always told them to do when they were children. And Tracy Payne said his mother still tells him to tuck in his shirt tail and straighten his hair. Doesn't she? Some said that their mothers told them to always make their beds in the morning, always wash their hands before mealtime, to always say please and thank you. One's mother said to do something kind for another person every day, even if you have to go out of your way to do it. These are things their mothers wanted them to do, and they tried to drill these things into their heads through constant repetition. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. But since we are in church, perhaps the question we should ask today is not what did our mothers want us to do, but what does God want us to do? A question that was answered hundreds of years ago by the Old Testament prophet Micah, who said, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? It's the justice part that I want to talk about today. I was still partly asleep when I got the news about the death of Osama bin Laden. I had just poured my first cup of coffee, taken that first sip when I opened the newspaper and saw that headline shouting at me from the page, Bin Laden killed. I, I could hardly believe it. I wasn't prepared for that kind of news. But as I read the article, all those images began to come back into my brain again. Airplanes flying into tall buildings and billowing flames coming from within, those twin towers coming down. I could still see those people fleeing from the city under a cloud of ash and could still imagine what it must have been like for those inside those towers. Back on September 11, 2001, our president assured us that justice would be done. And here, in the article I was reading, our president was telling us justice had been done. The man behind the attack on America had been killed. I, first of all, just breathed a sigh of relief because I thought, well, at least we won't be bothered by him anymore. As the day wore on, however, I found that I became increasingly uncomfortable with the use of the word justice to describe what had been done. Don't get me wrong, I was glad it had been done. It was necessary to stop Osama bin Laden, and we found a way to stop him. If I had been president, I hope I would have had the courage to order it. But was it justice? That's where I got hung up. For me, justice has always meant that something wrong is made right. So that if somebody takes $100 from me and somebody else makes them give it back, and justice is done. I got back what I lost. But I couldn't see how shooting and killing someone was justice. How did that make everything right? When has it ever made anything right? We did not get back all those lives that were lost on September 11, 2001. But as some people said, we did get the guy who did it. And for some of them, that was a cause for celebration. They spilled out into the streets, began to wave American flags and chant, USA, USA. Now, compare that scene with the one in Acts chapter 2. Because here, people have spilled out onto the street. 
It was the day of Pentecost, just another Jewish festival in so many ways, but on that day, the Spirit of God came upon the believers. They were filled up to overflowing. They went out onto the streets, speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. They caused such a ruckus that some people thought they were drunk. And Peter stood up and said, no, they're not filled with new wine. They are filled with Holy Spirit. This is just what the prophet Joel was talking about that in the last days God's Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh, both men and women. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And all of this, Peter said, all of this is because of Jesus. Jesus was not only a prophet mighty in word and deed, according to Peter, but also God's one and only anointed one, the Messiah. This Jesus you crucified, Peter says to the crowds, but God raised him up. Now, stop right there for a minute. If justice means that something wrong has been made right, this is an odd kind of justice. Or maybe it is God's kind of justice. Think about it. Peter is talking to a group of people who were complicit in the execution of the Messiah. In Peter's own words, these Israelites are the ones who killed Jesus by the hands of those outside the law. There they are, looking back at Peter as he preaches, as he says to them, you crucified Jesus. What would justice look like in a situation like that? What would you do to the people who killed the Messiah? I remember that parable Jesus told about the wicked tenants who wouldn't give to the owner of the vineyard the fruit that was rightfully his. Do you remember that one? He sent some of his slaves to collect the fruit and they, they beat some, they killed some, they stoned some. He sent other servants and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his only son thinking, surely they will respect my son. But they didn't. They killed him and threw his body over the wall. End of story. Jesus was telling this parable to some of the religious authorities there in Jerusalem. And when he finished, he said, so what do you think? What will the owner of the vineyard do with these wicked tenants? And they said, he will put those wretches to a miserable death. Do you see? That's our kind of justice. That's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth justice. The kind Gandhi said would eventually leave the whole world blind and toothless. But it is not God's kind of justice. Just after the religious authorities have said that the owner of the vineyard will put those wretches to a miserable death, Jesus says, have you never read the scripture? The one about the stone that was rejected by the builders, how it became the corner stone? The Lord doesn't respond by putting those wretches who killed his son to a miserable death. He responds by taking the stone the builders have rejected and making it the cornerstone. He responds by scooping up the broken body of his beloved boy and breathing the breath of everlasting life into it, setting him on an eternal throne. Take that, God says. I think of Peter standing there looking at the crowd that had been responsible for the death of Jesus, telling them to their faces that they had killed God's Messiah. God could have taken out on them our kind of justice. He could have smashed that crowd with his mighty fist and obliterated all of them. But he didn't. We killed his son. God raised him up. That's God's kind of justice. That's how God makes things right not by killing the people who killed his son, but by giving his son back what they took from him, his life. That's not even the most amazing part. There is Peter standing there 
talking to the people who killed Jesus. And when he does, they are cut to the heart. They say to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? We now know what we did. We killed the Messiah. God help us. But what should we do now? Is there any way we can make things right? And listen to what Peter says. He doesn't say, you can do this. You can die a miserable death, you wretches. He doesn't say, you can do this. You can rot in hell for eternity. He says, you can do this. You can repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and your sins will be forgiven. What's more, you will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit, for this is His promise to you and to your children and to all who are far off whom He calls to Himself. If that's justice, it is a different kind of justice than most of us know anything about. As Americans, we promise that if you kill a few thousand of our citizens, we will hunt you down and find you and kill you. It may take us 10 years to do it, but we will do it. If, on the other hand, you kill God's beloved Son, He is going to raise Him from the dead and invite you to join His church. He is going to forgive your sins and offer the gift of His Holy Spirit. That's not justice, is it? Not our kind of justice. It may not even be God's kind of justice. It may be His mercy that He shows. And if it is, then I'm not sure I want to see His justice. Which one of us really wants the God who is able to see every deed and hear every word, and know every thought, which one of us wants that God to give us exactly what we deserve? Not me. G.K. Chesterton once said that children who believe themselves to be innocent want justice, but we who know ourselves to be guilty want mercy. We not only want mercy, we need mercy. We stand there with that crowd on the day of Pentecost it, as Peter looks at us and says, you are the reason Jesus had to die. You killed him. And we say, what should we do? What should you do? He says, I'll tell you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off whom God calls to Himself. On the day of Pentecost, some 3,000 people were added to the church, and some of them, maybe most of them, were those who had cried out for the crucifixion of Jesus. That is a different kind of justice than the kind we're familiar with. That is God's kind of justice. You kill His Son, and He will raise Him up again. And it's a different kind of mercy than we're used to. It is God's kind of mercy. You say you're sorry, and He invites you into His church. His ways are not our ways. But on this Mother's Day, I want to suggest that we do sometimes catch a glimpse of God's kind of justice and mercy. I think about this when there is a well-publicized murder trial going on, and you see on television the accused sitting there in his orange prison jumpsuit, his ankles and wrist chained together, but often there in the courtroom sitting just behind him is his mother. And no matter what he's done, she's the one who's saying he's a good boy. He just got mixed up with the wrong crowd. See, she knows some things not everybody else knows, and she can remember what it was like to hold him just after he was born, 
when he was absolutely innocent and his whole life was stretched out in front of him. She remembers what it was like to kiss his cheeks and smell his newborn smell and believe in his future. She knows not only the things he has done wrong in his life, but also the things he has done right. Her love is like God's love in that respect. When nobody else believes in him, she does. When everyone else has given up hope, she has it. Reminds me of a poem by Wendell Berry, whose mother was a member of my church in Kentucky. Her name was Virginia, and when I close her eyes, I can still see her face looking up at me as she made her way out of church after worship. Those soft pouches under her pale blue eyes, still twinkling. She must have told Wendell, her son, a thousand times to sit up straight, to eat all his vegetables, to say please and thank you. It must have worked. Wendell Berry is one of the most celebrated poets in America. And when his mother died, he wrote this poem. I was your rebellious son. Do you remember? Sometimes I wonder if you do remember. So complete has your forgiveness been. So complete has your forgiveness been, I wonder sometimes if it did not precede my wrong, and I erred safe found within your love, prepared ahead of me, the way home, or my bed at night, so that almost I should forgive you, who perhaps foresaw the worst that I might do, and forgave before I could act, causing me to smile now, looking back, to see how paltry was my worst compared to your forgiveness of it, already given. And this, then, is the vision of that heaven of which we have heard, where those who love each other have forgiven each other. Where, for that, the leaves are green, the light a music in the air, and all is unentangled, and all is undismayed. Let us pray. Lord, we long for everything to be right, right with a capital R. You are the only one we trust with that task the only one who knows what the world would look like if everything were finally and forever put right. So let us continue to pray, Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done until all is unentangled and all is undismayed. Amen.